little bit of paper here because these are the things that we've covered in in the last few months uh, and in no particular order. Uh, there was uh, field landings in alpine alpine terrain. So, you know, we, we had a chat about field landings um, and hopefully, uh, you know, uh, allayed some people's uh, thoughts about it. Uh, we had competition and expedition preparation. Um, you know, basically, that's basically about getting yourself ready um, you know, and is useful for organising yourself for a retrieve. We've had um, use of the moving map. That was uh, Kate who, who went through that. Um, we had some basic hints for new pilots. Um, we had a bit of a, on wave soaring and introduction to it uh, and also making the most of our opportunities. And lastly, uh, the last time, uh, Stuart uh, uh, went through um, a coaching flight that he had with Phil uh, during the um, uh, during the UK during the um, what do you call it Scottish uh, cross country development week. So, I mean, when we started this, so we're doing the review. When we started this, the first thing that I said or intimated was that we only get about four to six weekends where we have a soaring opportunity where we can fly 200 kilometers or more. And that's not a lot. So, and we had basically one marginal day that really didn't turn them out, out. So we got four to six weekends. So that is eight to 12 days where we have the potential to soar. So it's not a lot. And the whole point of, uh, of doing this, this series of talks was to um, get ourselves prepared or see the tools that are available to us. So, but before we start going into that, um, Stuart, this week we've been very fortunate in, to a certain degree, particularly at Port Moat, in that we've had this polar air mass and it's been really quite nice. Um, and particularly yesterday, uh, I think a cloud base was 6,700 um, and also Wednesday was a, was a good day. So, and a polar air mass is, is, is really great uh, and we've been quite fortunate. Unfortunately for weekend pilots, uh, it's not been available, but I mean, I, I've just been looking on, uh, on glide and seat uh, and there are a few gliders flying and it does look soarable, uh, but it's not as good as it has been the last couple of days. So while we're talking about that, have you got a hand mic uh, there, Stuart? No, no. There. All right, okay. So if it's okay, and this is a bit of last rush thing, um, Stuart did a flight of 167K. Stuart, have you have you uh, actually got your silver yet? Uh, I, I, I hope I have it from yesterday, but... <laughs> oh, that's it. Yesterday, so yesterday today. was your silver... Was your silver distance? Was it? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, okay, that's cool. That's what. I, that's well. Congratulations. Anyway, that's brilliant. So I'm just going to bring up. I'm just going to bring up. Uh, let me just do this. <clears throat> there we are. And I'm just going to run it. And I'll do it at a speed of twenty. If it gets boring, then I'll speed it up a bit. <laughs> And you can basically talk your way through it, Stuart. Okay. So I'll yeah, just yeah. start it. Hang on a tick. There we go. Okay. Whoops. Where are we? In the field. Yeah, down at the bottom there. Oh, that's boring. I think I'll speed it up. A yeah, bit. it was. It was. Uh, <laughs> it was switched on for a bit. There we go. That's me. Off. Oh, okay. There we go. Oh, yeah. I'll slow it down again. There we go. Right, off you go, mate. Right, so I, uh, I decided to take an air tour up to Glen Farg because that's, you know, it's going to start earlier there because the hills and you could see the odd cumulus starting to form. Took a tour to uh, 3000. Um, just got myself settled in and established for the first wee bit, just getting back into the glen. It's the, it's the second time I've flown it with its tips on, so I was just trying to get used to um, flying at the air. So just dance from cloud to cloud for a wee bit. Um, and then eventually got bored of that and decided I better go back and start the task. Which uh, so I flew back to um, to the loch, um, took a start time there, and uh, 
if I'm already ahead of the trees. <laughs> so, oh, well, I'll, I'll speed, speed it up, up then. Yeah, yeah. Speed it up. Yeah. Okay, let me do that. Can make fill it up some books if you want. <laughs> right. Yeah. You haven't started yet, have no, you? No, I haven't started yet. No, oh, right. I'm just kind of getting, getting established. Yeah. Yeah. Thing to look is cloud base, right? There it is. Yeah. So we had about three seven there. What I'd done for the day, I'd set a task um, uh, out to uh, Aberfoyle, back to Cooper, and then back to um, Lake and Monteith, and then my finish point was back at uh, Port Moak from memory. Yeah. Um, I didn't actually do that task in the end, uh, and the reason was as the day progressed, there was a bit of a blue gap just beyond. The the locals okay and, and i'm still um traumatized by a couple of crossings of that area with phil <laughs> thought it was a bit of a blue hole and it also showed a rasp was a bit of a blue hole in the forecast so I, I decided to completely um alter my um my task and headed out towards um Lochern where you could see better clouds forming and there's like a little odd sign of wave caps on top of some of the cumulus that were out that way and um, so that was a bit a bit more fun than uh, scrabbling around at dune um so went over the back of the locals, got an, another couple of climbs there, um, very quickly realized how um annoying the airspace is there as I bashed up against the top of it. Um so I kind of went within 500 foot of it and then basically I was supposed to say bar to the knees, stick full forward, um, and uh, uh kind yeah, of but I make a point that. about that, yeah, Stuart, yeah. because you see, we're looking at four thousand seven hundred feet. Yeah. That's your altitude. Yeah. And it's five it's uh it's uh is it five thousand five hundred feet? It's five, so that, five, five, yeah. five, five. Oh, that's the point yeah. I was gonna make. So it's flight level five five. Yeah. But what we've got is that's based on one zero one three, whereas you know the pressure whereas it's based on 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 you know your altitude is based on on uh, you know the actual Q and H if you see Aye. my point. Yeah, yeah. So that actually can provide a restriction if, if, yeah, yeah. if you see Aye. where I'm coming from. And it was quite apparent as well. Yeah, it was, it was good air all through that section as well. So it was quite hard work to stay stay the five hundred foot uh, yeah. clearance. So, um, and of course, once you've got speed on, cracking the air brakes is a bit of a problem. So, um, it was a bit of a learning point there. I can crack the air brakes on mine, but it's yeah, not not advisable. Anyway, I saw a good um, oh, I saw this, this little wispies um over the uh, uh Comrie. Um, yeah. So head towards just stop these. it. Yeah. I can stop it if you want. Yeah. yeah. Um, head to other wispies and um, again it was working quite well um, thermal so climbed up to more or less base there again and what was the base there uh, at that time from memory it was about uh, so it was getting on towards five and a half six at that time I think yeah okay yeah yeah so I could see um, clouds sitting uh, kind of lined up a bit wave like uh, a Loch Erin yeah um and you could also see these sort of wisps over the top. So I decided to head down there and see if I could get more height and get the St. Fillon's turn point. Um, so I got the St. Fillon's turn point and then went beyond it and managed to get up to 9,000 foot in the in the wave there. So I spent a bit of time kind of just getting to know what clouds were working and what weren't. And it was quite surprising. Ones I was expecting would be working weren't and ones that I didn't expect were. So it was quite good just to spend a bit of time playing around in that, just to just a massive cumulus with caps on top of them that weren't going up in front which i just couldn't understand why why i wasn't getting any wave at these points you know um but anyway i managed to maintain i got to about nine thousand foot well i just carry on there then i'll yeah. just start it up because at this height here you're 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 in the wave yeah it's definitely uh, waves, six thousand yeah, yeah. six thousand eight hundred feet yeah right uh, so we got a uh so we got a it's really interesting in my opinion is he had a very cold polar air mass winds were very light yeah, yeah. Um, and what wind were you getting there? It was it was showing about twenty knots. When See, it was up at so you know, fifteen knots. Lower you got there. very bubbly air mass. You know, beautiful polar air mass, but you're still getting wave off a bit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which you know, with twenty knots, mm. it's not a lot. It just goes to show. I always have a theory that you always have to think about the things that are stopping wave, not what's creating it. Yeah, yeah. and 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 really got everything going against us with such a bubbly air but it's still we're still getting wave because there's a bit of wind yeah. um you know once you're in the mountains that is Aye. yeah so i'll just start the trace again it was it was very it was, it felt to me very confused because you know the the, the, the wave was lining up north um east west which you'd expect because that's the way the terrain's sitting and um, the wind was west and so working out 
where the bar actually was when it wasn't well marked was quite interesting. So I, I, I doddled around a lot of time there just trying to learn what was going on, you know. Um, Can I interrupt there again, Stuart? Yeah. I'll just pause it there. I mean, one of the things that I look at, see, we're at 8,500 feet there, which is getting up to your maximum altitude. On a Q day, because there, there are often days, there are often days where it's thermic underneath. Like I was flying on Wednesday uh, and I did the 100K triangle and Alistair was at 9,000 feet and did a, a 300, uh, 300K uh, quadrilateral. And the thing I always look for is, is that normally cloud streets on a thermic day go downwind. Uh, but what tends to happen is a thing to always watch when the day begins and there's a bit of wind. So the thing I always look for is I always look to see what's prevalent because there are plenty of days where you see the thermals kicking off and they're actually a crosswind, and that's indicating wave influence. And uh, on um, and on Wednesday, you could actually see that. Would you Would you agree with that, Sir yeah. Alistair? Yeah. You know, and you could see it in the sky. You could see it in the sky where you had cloud streaks, and then you see a bar going across. And it's always a good indication, um, and and it's a thing you know to watch out. I mean, the thing that's really nice about your flight yesterday, to be quite honest, you. And I'm not being funny about it, at your level of experience, I mean, I know the hand gliding aside, but at your level of experience to actually transition from thermal into wave, and it wasn't because I was watching from Dundee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it's quite interesting because it, there, there was not much of an indication of wave yesterday, hmm. unlike well, Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just a bit. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, so we'll carry on then. Right, so go up to 9,000. One of the things I didn't do, I maybe should have done actually, because I, by that time, decided I wasn't doing the declare task. I didn't actually at that point declare a new task in my head. And I think if I had, I spent a lot of time just wandering around looking at the view, <laughs> which is a lot of fun. I could have probably just been more conscious and said, right, this is what I'm going to do. And I didn't, you know, but I decided I was going to go to the Almarie turn point. And that, that, that wee kink there was me getting around the back of it, yeah. There we go. So you kink, um, uh, uh, so that that was still still high at that point. So still above cloud base. Um, as I came out into this area, I started to drop below cloud base and get into the thermals again. Yeah. So at some point in this process of meandering around, I decided to head towards the Perth turn point, um, only because it'd been mentioned earlier on the day. But <laughs> um, as uh, working well up there when um, um, Ron was doing his briefing. So I had got the uh, the bridge at, uh, at Perth. And at that point, I was taking lots of photos looking down at the office because usually I'm looking out the office window looking up at people. <laughs> and it's such, a, it's such a much nicer view from there looking down on the office. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So I got the Perth turn point. At that point, I was looking at the watch because I was aware that there's a, a steep drop off at three o'clock. So I wasn't going to be too far away when it dropped off. So decided to head out towards uh Comrie and Creef again, see how, how that went. Um, so again, just taking thermal all the way. Um, just at this point, I was getting alarms on my um, my uh, XC soar about airspace. So uh, I was just watching that edge, that little corner there. So I nicked around that. We're looking and at then, the 6,000 foot cloud base. 6,000 foot, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I got up to base again here. So whatever height I'm, I'm, I'm getting to now was was thermal base at that time. So that's, was that 6,500? Nicked around the turn point at Creef and then started heading back. Now, there's two things I experimented with this trip. The first thing, I put my oxygen on for the first time, even though it was only 9,000 feet, I thought it'd be good to practice getting the oxygen on. So I did that and it's great stuff. High as a kite. Anyway, <laughs> so I put the oxygen on. And and you'll see in this flat I'm meandering. Around. That was me experiment with the P tube. <laughs> so <laughs> so so lots of firsts for that flight um, yesterday. So, um, but yeah, directional directional control was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> Who minds that? So, <laughs> 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 so 
so headed headed back um towards um there's a you could see there's a big and I was calling it a convergence set up over um Fife and it had been on the on the forecast is sitting red late late on the day. So I thought I'll put a bit extra distance in and head up towards Cooper. Um so I got a really good climb over Gateside back up to base and then pushed up round the Fruity turn point instead of the Cooper. The Cooper one was a bit out to the north and it was um in the blue. Um, Can I stop you there? Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting point. I'll just stop this. Yeah, was it a convergence or was it weave? <laughs> no, no, no. Um, situational awareness, right? Um, obviously, as people become more experienced, you you develop situational awareness of of your environment. And the, the point that you made there about convergence is that in your planning you'd looked at it and there was a potential for convergence mm. and and what you do when you plan a flight is you get the information you know i through the weather and so on right and what you're then doing is using that information um to base your decisions if you see my point and because of your preparation right you you are able to recognize you know a situation developing mm. because of the information that you've garnered prior to the flight and that's interesting mm. because you know in your planning by looking at the weather you come up with you know a course of action and options do, do you see my drift on that mm. and i think that's really what one has to do every time one flies mm. um so yeah, that's my point on that. Yeah. Uh, you've planned quite a big task there, yeah. um, but did you actually have a fallback task in your head before you got I, airborne? I, or I did you, didn't or did you... have a fallback no. one. Um, um, no, it's a probably should have. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I thought that was the case, but it was quite obvious from what you said earlier on yeah, that yeah. you didn't. You, know, you, you just wandered about for mm -hmm. a while. Mm -hmm. If 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 you'd had a fallback task and you were only a third of the way down the first leg. Uh, when you made that decision to head north instead of west, yeah, you could have gone back and started a shorter task. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from the same turning point and flown mm -hmm. through the same air mass that you're now familiar with, mm -hmm. um, uh, and perhaps gone a different direction. Yeah, like my, my average for the day was fifty kilometers an hour, so yes. it was <laughs> it was a yeah. lot of like playing around, going on, and not really going for it. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and another thing I'd like to point out, whilst we've got this map up, is uh, your first leg. It, right at the beginning of the day is into wind okay in the yeah. weaker lift and yeah. that's quite difficult to achieve Aye, whereas true. if you go downwind in the weaker lift uh give the weather half an hour to an hour to get going yeah and then go into wind in the best part of the day Aye. and then at the end of the day downwind final glide which you've actually got here yeah um you that's, fixed that's a, my stuff that i was going to talk about oh. tonight oh but there we go <laughs> I'll, carry on, I'll shut up <laughs> <laughs> you carry on you carry on Ron. sorry you've got any more points to make about uh, no. that that's great i think i think the thing that in terms of the thousand meter rule i i, I arrived some like you know two and a half thousand foot higher than i i started so no problem with that and, and my finish line was fruity I could have given the height I was at. I was at base at Fruki. I had I had like full air brake on for you know about three minutes to get back. To, I could I could have probably gone out all the way to like five less and back if I if I'd actually thought about it. But anyway, I, I decided <laughs> I'd use my pea tube. I, I, my day was was as good as I could get. <laughs> good. Right, let's just carry this on. Are we finished? Oh, we're coming back. Yeah, we're almost finished there, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I did. I did get snowed on um, above Fruki actually, which was quite <laughs> worrying because it was just a fine crystallized sort of you know stuff, and it, mm. it stuck to the leading edge like no, in seconds. It was like it was all fuzzy on the leading edge, but it, like it didn't. It was eight degrees down the airfield, so it was gone by the time I landed. But it was on my mind what it was going to be like handling coming in. But uh, so yeah, that was it. Fantastic. Good. Fantastic well done. Yeah. Excellent. Any questions on that at all? And um, from from our Zoom audience, any questions? Okay. Can, right, can, I, we'll can do... I just say that it wasn't just the fifty k's for the longest part you know, within the flight? It was also a silver height, wasn't it? Yeah, ah, uh, yeah. six thousand height gain. Yeah, yeah. So there's uh, just two two legs of the bad plane there. So I think uh, congratulations and well yeah. done. <laughs> yeah, well done.
Excellent. Well done, Stuart. Okay, so what we'll do now then is we'll um, get into what we were talking about, which is a review of, um, of what we've covered over the last few months. And to a certain degree, you know, Stuart has just demonstrated, you know, the use of that information and obviously his own ability as well. So if we just go through it, I mean, what we're going to, the way I'm going to sort of approach this is, as I say, we've only got four to six weekends in which to do it. And so one of the points I'm going to make tonight at, uh, at tonight's talk is that gliding is not a hobby, in my opinion. Uh, it's not something that you can pick up and put down. It's, it's quite technical. Uh, you can get yourself killed if you uh, are complacent. Um, it's a highly skilled um, vocation, in, in my opinion. And, you know, it's not something that can be put up, uh, p picked up and put down. It requires a lot of commitment. And so I think hobby is an insult to gliding. It's not a bloody hobby. You know, it really isn't. And if you can, if you treat it as a hobby, you're not going to be any good at it. It's, it's quite simple. And so it's a matter of adopting the right mindset, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I quite agree, you know. Oh, going for a wander is perfectly acceptable. I, I really don't. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's great. But it's not a bloody hobby. It isn't. It's like having a bloody, it's like hobby. It's like standing around saying you've got a bloody train set. Jesus Christ. <laughs> or, or reading a book or whatever. Anyway, coming back to it. Sorry, I've been angry enough today as it is. Yeah. Um, so coming back to it, the way you look at it is, you, you, you know, you, you think about it and you just don't pick it up at the weekend but you prepare for the weekend. Um, and, and so that to a certain degree involves a bit of long-term planning. And so, you know, to me, the thing that you do is you look at the weather and you make sure for the weekend that your equipment's ready. You know, so you're gonna be flying at the weekend. So you're planning before you get to the weekend. All right, that's if you're really interested in it. So, Yeah, so there's three components to it. We've got the weather, uh, we've got the equipment, which we're looking at the glider, the trailer, and yourself. And we're going to be talking about uh, ourselves uh, later on uh, today or later on in the thing. Um, and so, what I always look at, when I look at the weather, I always consider the potential tasks that I'm going to have available. And I actually have a little I actually have a little um, library of tasks that uh, I'll consider for a certain day. Um, so really, before we come at the club at the weekend, you should have, having looked at the weather, have an idea of what tasks you want to do. And make sure your personal equipment's ready. What I do is, if I'm flying, if it's going to be a good day, I have more, all my equipment in the car, ready to go, first thing in the morning and I have I, I go through a checklist of everything that I need to have right so I'm all ready to go and obviously you want to be current I mean if you're not current at this time of the year you know you, you again you're messing about uh, as I said right at the beginning when we started this there has to be a level of commitment if you want to actually be successful at it So that's the long-term planning. Um, when we come to the actual day, what you want to do is you want to remove all the distractions 
that are um, that can possibly affect your flight. And so, what we've checked is obviously the weather, the no tams, and the equipment. We've got it all ready. Glider at the launch point. I'm a great believer. I I I know that uh, I will not perform well if I'm rushed. To give you an example, on, on Wednesday, um, I had to take my wife to get her feet sorted out uh, in the morning. And uh, so I was going to arrive at the club late. So I arrived at half past 10. And one of the things I always try to do is get to the front of the queue. Um, I always want to be at the front of the queue. So I have the choice of when I launch. And I arrived here, I got my glider out, and at half past 11, I'm about, you know, six or eight on the queue. And I thought, shall I go winch or aero toe? And I could see the aero toe launch point, too many gliders. I thought I'll go to winch. Actually, if I had gone to the um, aero toe point, I would have launched exactly the same time as I, I winched. But because of the system that we have for, for launching gliders off winches, it involves putting the glider up all the rest of it, you know, getting into, you know, and so you're being rushed all the time, pushing gliders about uh, and getting to the front of the, you know, to get to the launch point. I didn't even have time to, I knew I was going to fly the 100K triangle, right? That's what I set my task, but I didn't have time to put it into my computer. So I'm feeling stressed. I can feel my performance is, is not good, but it to my, you know, I am a highly experienced glider pilot and I can cope with that. Now, if I'd have been a less experienced pilot, I think my performance would have been significantly deteriorated. Um, but I could cope because of my experience level. And I did actually quite a, a, a decent flight for the conditions. And so it really comes and we're going to be talking about it, about, you know, reducing stress and all this sort of stuff later on. You really, when you, when you get into a glider, you've really got to be focused, right? I mean, Ryan has a thing about not having a mobile phone on the airfield. And I think that's actually quite good because whilst I was talking on a mobile phone once, I reversed into my glider. So I think it's a good idea not to uh, have a mobile phone. The point that I'm making is that you use all the facilities around you to work to your benefit, not to the detriment of it. Have you got any point on that, Ron? You know, anything you care to add on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it can be stressful and it can be something as simple as um, not setting the, the volume on the video properly. Yeah. And you get airborne and you get distracted. And by the time you've got it set up, you're falling out the thermal and you're back in yeah. the circuit. You know, it's um, it, preparation is everything. Absolutely. It really is. Okay. And we're, we're going to cover that again. So, and then there's the flight itself. Um, before we start talking about the flight itself, I mean, we just talk about the, um, this particular picture. Uh, this is taken up at, um, up near Edsall between, well, it's actually up at Fordoon and um, the Seabreeze front came in and I caught it just at the right time. And it came into such an extent, I flew up it at 120 knots and then flew back down it. And I just timed it that I was literally within less than a mile of the Aberdeen zone because it was advancing into the Aberdeen zone and into, uh, and I, I, another three minutes and I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been able to get, use it to go back I, it was just time for perfection and as Stuart mentioned right um you know, um convergences uh rasp is particularly good in my opinion at uh, forecasting convergences it's rasp is really good at it um and I always on a thermal day and there's a basic rule for that is if the wind is less than, if the prevailing wind is less than 10 knots, then you're going to get a convergence. 
of some form or another, basically. There are other factors, but, you know, if the wind's greater than 10 knots, uh, when I say the probability, 10 knots and below, you've got a good chance of a, 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 of a, a convergence. And once above 20 knots, forget it. So, you know, it depends. You're, 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 you're looking slightly askew there, uh, Phil. Yeah, just that, yeah. Just about the New Zealand. Yeah. Can you really? Well, well, I mean, I'm... Only the lamp table features. It's clearly had sensitivity that's flowing through and over the mountain. Um, so, I've just come back from New Zealand. So, in New Zealand, they were getting convergences in 10, sorry, 15 to 20 knots of wind yeah. occasionally. Um, <clears throat> typically, coming over the mountains onto the coastal plain, you actually have quite a strong sea breeze making its way in yeah. against that, unbelievably. Yeah. And uh, you get a very strong convergence line uh, running for many, many kilometres, you know, 100 kilometres in parts. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, just, just an oddity, possibly, in New Zealand. No, well, not necessarily, Phil, because, the, the, you know, uh, the. The prob what I'm saying is the probability between 10 and 20 knots reduces as the wind speed increases. I mean, that's, I mean, this bit of paper or this, I've, I've got this information actually that, um, uh, that John Henry gave me uh, as to the formation of sea breezes and, and that's in the UK. Um, you know, the point I'm making is, I would say more than 20 knots is it's unlikely and the probability increases as the speed as the wind speed reduces okay so we digress slightly but i mean it's an interesting picture uh, and from the point of view of the sea breeze the sea breeze air is that way coming in from the east and the prevailing flow is uh, from the west and if we look at the sky it's starting to get a bit over over convected over developed any questions on that particular picture as a matter of interest it's it's usually a good area in a westerly for a convergence up that way i will say that i always look for it okay so the flight you know consists of uh a view, your glider performance, and the weather. And basically, what we have to do in a nutshell is to deal with its variability. We have a mental model of what we're expecting. And the trick is to fit your mental model into what's actually going on, because we're quite capable of deceiving ourselves. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that to a certain degree. And so that's my point, second point, dealing with it and your reaction to it. And again, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Okay. And, and this is where we're coming to it, your performance. Okay, now I've used this analogy um, I mean, what I did was I was trying to find an overflowing tier um, because all of us have a, a, a capacity for stress. And um, I'll just bring this up. All right. Um, eh? <laughs> <laughs> this was something I prepared earlier. <laughs> um, I mean, there's this, I forgot what it's called, this bloody graph thing, this curve, what do they call it? You know, where you've got your arousal level and, and, and yeah, the arousal performance curve. Well, everybody's bloody heard of that, right? And, you know, about optimum performance and all the rest of the shit, right? Now, All of us have a certain stress level. Now, my stress level is usually about there. I'm, I'm actually quite a highly stressed character. Um, I mean, 
a person's stress levels, you know, it, 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 when you look at an individual, uh, their, you know, there's their natural, you know, personality which they're born with, and then there's their, their, um, the environment that they've grown up with, and the knowledge that they've acquired through it, and depending upon. Yeah, I'm not being funny about it. I'm not being snobby about it or anything like that. But if you look at people that go to public school, for example, they are they they have an attitude that the world is their oyster and so on. And so their conditioning while they're going through public school is that they are part of an elite. And so they have a natural self-confidence. You know, the majority of them, there are some people, you know, get yeah. bullied and all this sort of stuff at public school and so on. I mean, it's a sweeping generalisation. This is where, you know, but do you see where I'm coming from on that? So we've all got a certain level of stress. Now, mine, as I say, is up here because just, you know, it's me. John Williams is sort of just there. And I always look at John Williams because John Williams has this capacity to absorb stress. And tonight I'll, I've got a little video that I'll just show you, um, you know, as to, you know, how he's coping with that stress, um, which I think is brilliant. Um, but obviously when you're flying an aircraft, you, can get into stressful sort of situations. And you, I, I really do mean it that it's, I am basically quite an introspective person, um, but I, I, I really do believe in the motto, know thyself, right? And know your failings and know your attributes. Now I do know the things that I suffer from is, is projecting too much into the future, all right? Um, whereas what I'm good at is actually dealing with an immediate problem um, because I haven't got time to overthink it. Um, I'm very, you know, uh, I, do you see where I'm coming from where, where what I'm trying to explain is, is that there's different types of stress and there's different ways of handling it. And that depends upon your personality. And so the point that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to is that as you go through a flight, what happens is you can get into situations where your stress levels increase. And the thing you've got to be really careful about is that you don't get into a situation where it overflows and you're then not functioning properly, right? And once you've got, and I have in my flying career got to stages like that, and it's usually in the simulator. <laughs> it's never happened in real life, well, that's, that's not true. I once, I once, I once, when I was a PPL, I once did a flight and I got lost. And I got so wound up about it that if you'd lifted my arm up into the air, I wouldn't have had the sense to bring it back down again. I was so over, uh, what's the word? Um, yeah. So how do you draw yourself back from that? You know, and that's the key. Right. What you've got to do is you've got to relieve the stress. Right. And that's where the tap comes in. Just open the tap, get rid of the stress or start producing it down to sort of certain levels. OK. Any questions up to now? You got any points to make about that, Ron? Um. Yeah, when you, when you find yourself getting into stressful situations, you, the first thing you've got to do is recognise that you are getting stressed, that, that you're not performing, uh, and recognition of that is, I think, is a big thing. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Uh, so you can uh, see it coming. It's, it's, all, it's, it's all got a bit peak tongue here. What can I do to um, stop it getting any worse? And then, right, I've got that under control. What can I do to now make it better? Yeah. Well, one of the things we taught in flying, or, you know, one of the things that I was always taught is that if it's really gone to absolute real shit, you know, is you sit on your hands and don't do anything and just take a deep breath and just sort of sit there and go. And I think I always say to myself is, what do I see? What do I see? What I'm actually looking at here. Now that's a really critical sort of situation, but, and we're slightly getting off, off track a bit. So to me, what it is, is a matter of creating the right environment so that you don't get into this situation. And we've already spoken about it. There's long-term planning and there's short-term planning. And basically the whole idea is to put yourself into a situation where you have as many options available to you and you manipulate the situation, like for example, making sure I'm at the front of the queue because your stress levels build up during the day and they, they can vary and all the rest of it. So we just carry on with that. So I'll just come back. We don't want to get into this state. <laughs> Love it. Okay. All oh, right. Okay. I've got my notes here, actually, because this has all been a bit rushed. Okay. So I'll just bring them across. All right. So I'll put here, removing as many as external and internal factors as possible, right? So external factors, all right, as I said, is full preparation so that you have less to worry about. You get into, you know, you've arrived early, you've got your glider ready, you're not rushed. If there's something needing done, get somebody else to do it. You know, I have a problem putting parachutes on. Why struggle? All right, I'll ask somebody to help me. I'll get into the aircraft nice and early and I'll set myself up. So the last thing you want to do is get into the air rushed, in my opinion. Okay. Um, Actually, the other day uh, I was flying uh, this during the checks with have eventualities. And I find it was it was something that Ron said, and I can't remember exactly what he said, but it made me really think that I oh, I know what it was. He says you shouldn't think you shouldn't be thinking about a cable break what you should be thinking about is the wing drop. And the point that you were making, Ron, is that you've got to break down the launch into its specific phases. And I thought that was very good because I, I thought I thought that was bloody good, right? Because you get into the aircraft and you, you know, and you're all keyed up, right? And I, and, and I sort of thought, you're absolutely right because I can be a bit disorganized in my thinking at times. And so I thought, well, hang on a minute. What's the first thing that's going to happen? Possible wind drop. Then there's the low level cable, low level cable break, low level, uh, medium level cable break and the high level cable break. Because the problem is, the problem is, is that what we do because we're lazy as human beings and we do things by rote is we turn around and go eventualities. Yeah. Okay. And then we move on and we've actually, we thought, yeah, I'm being safe and you're thinking about it, 
but you're actually not. You're just going through the process. And, you know, and I thought that was very good when you said that, Ron. Yeah, you can put all sorts of things into a chronological order. Yeah. And once you're past that sort of stepping stone, you can take that card out of your hand and throw it away. Yeah. And and the the, the more you go up the, the winch launch, for instance, the less playing cards you've got yeah. to look at. Yeah. Um, by the time you get to the top, you can throw yeah. the last one away. Okay. So, so you, you see that how these are ways of managing stress, if you see my point. I mean, people are naturally good at reacting to a situation because you haven't got time to be scared. I mean, the one that worries me is... Uh, The one that really worries me when I was flying commercially was electrical failure of unknown origin, um, because that is such a laborious checklist, right? That you really have to, you really have to work very concisely through the checklist. And one, I will say one of the things about the Airbus, just as a matter of interest is that it was a proper two crew aircraft and you really had to work together well. It was very much two crew coordination. Um, but the ones, the, the problems that really worry me are the ones where you've really got to time to think about it and to realise the depth of shit you're in <laughs> can potentially be in. That really frightens me. And you can, and the thing is, is if you can see it happening, this is where you turn around and say, uh, let's not go there <laughs> and move out of it. And it's spotting the potential pitfall arriving. Okay. So, yeah, we're talking about external factors. There's the internal ones, which is, again, like it comes back to, you know, uh, for example, fear. Um, you know, how do we handle ourselves when, when, when we're fearful? Um, again, coming back to things, the first thing you do, as I say, is sit, is sit on your hands and then I go, what do I see? What do I see? You know, what is actually happening here? Uh, because you can be, go down a course of action that is not, nece not necessarily correct, which brings me to, again, a thing that I was taught in flying. And it's been modified a little bit, and it's called um, it's a mnemonic Doda. And um, when you're in a high stress situation, you really you need something. You know, you need something to hang your hat on. You know, and 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 if you remember a mnemonic. It, it's a good way of working and so and it works for every or you modify it for every opportunity for every opportunity for every eventuality and you can use it for gliding but what it is is diagnose what situation am i in i'm lost right for example what are my options well what are my options um I'll tell you why I say that is because um, <laughs> I was uh, I was up north of Fort William uh, in 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 the discus and the UD packed up, all right. And and one of the things when you when you're low in the mountains, the sort of thing that really gets me. I mean, Fort William's quite okay, you know, because you've got you know Loch Ness and all the rest of it, right. But one of the sort of things that uh, really gets me when you're thermal soaring in, in the mountains is that when you low down, one mountain looks very much like another. <laughs> it's very difficult to decide where you are, right? Yeah, it, it, it is actually. When, I, when people ring me up and say, where are you, Sam? I go, I don't know, Scotland, you know. <laughs> I don't know where I am. I look at the map and, and I say I'm a, I'm a BLT, bacon, lettuce, and tomato. You know, because um, that's that's what I'm interested in. Um, but coming back to it, Mudi packed up, and I, and I thought, I thought, right, well, so coming back to it, diagnose 
options, decide, allocate doesn't uh, apply, review. So D-O-D-R. You know, so decide your options, sorry, diagnose your options, decide what you're going to do, and then review, is this the right decision? Okay. Now, my OD packed up, so what did I say to myself? I thought, well, I can see for 50, 60 miles, just go head south until you recognise something. <laughs> because eventually, if I just head south, I mean, what am I going to come across? I mean, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to come across Edinburgh or Glasgow. If I head east, I'm going to get to bloody Aberdeen. And if I head west, I'm going to go hit the west coast. And then you just go down it. You know. That's one of the things when I flew in the Antarctic, right? When I flew in the Antarctic, which is a big place, um, we used to have, uh, we used to have, um, we didn't have GPS in those days. We used to have a thing called Doppler TANS. And, um, and, you know, and it was as accurate as the information that you put in, right? And um, so if you put in the wrong information, you ended up, you know, not ended up where you wanted to be. But the thing is, it's got inbuilt errors and they're gradually built up, right? And so you fly around various places at the last place, you see, you're never lost because you always knew where you took off from. So if you're flying 120 miles, you're 120 miles away from your takeoff point. But when you don't know where you took off from, then you're truly lost. <laughs> so coming back to it, Dodar, right? Diagnose, options, decide, review. Now, again, when I was taught to fly, is the thing that you always have is the get out of jail card, right? You always have options, right? You never want to be in a situation whereby you're down to one option, because if you lose that option, then, then you're buggered, basically. And so... Again, coming back to being overstressed, where you start to get overstressed is where you end up with less and less options. And you get to feel, again, it's a Swiss cheese model and all the rest of the stuff, right? But basically, as one gains experience, you can, you can see, you can feel the situation develop, developing. And it is, as one's just said, a matter of recognizing it. Am I talking crap here? I mean, you know. So it's one of the things that we have about, about, um, uh, sorry, I've just lost my train of thought here. Um, let me just gather it again. Um, yeah, turbos. Um, one of the things you've really got to be careful in turbos is that if you constantly depend upon the engine, right, uh, you, you can get yourself into, and, and as much as people s say to themselves, I'll land in that field there, I always sit there when I'm flying and I go, are you really going to land in that field there? Is that field really going to be where you're going to go if the engine fails? I always take a step back and have a look at it. So it is a matter of having options because this is where we're sort of finishing. And always having one, you'll get out of jail card. You know, unfortunately, we've all been in a situation, well, I know I have, where I've gone, this either has to work or I'm going to crash. And that's not a good option. And you should never get there. Now, some of us have been in that situation. And you really don't want to be there. Uh, I mean, I'm speaking truthfully. Um, any points on, on what I'm saying, Ron? Uh, no, that's, that's absolutely right. You, you don't want to be there. You really uh, don't. And when you do find yourself there, you'll realise why. 
Yeah. <laughs> Phil, you're sitting there pensively. What have you got to say about this lot? Um, yeah, I mean, not, not much more than you've already said, Sand. I mean, just going back to you, mnemonic or whatever acronym, the one I've used is SOAR, which is appropriate for gliding. Situations, options, action, and review. Yeah. But uh, that's kind of springs yeah. to mind. But I think the thing about uh, sitting on your hands, which you can't really do in a glider, but I know what you mean. Uh, just, um, I, mean, I was in a sticky situation a couple of weeks ago flying in New Zealand, low down on the ridges in a pretty blind valley, actually, with a huge lake at the bottom of it. And I started to, you know, the stress level started to rise up, and I was thinking, this isn't good. But then I just sort of said, hang on, you've flown in the mountains a lot. Just calm down. It doesn't look great. You know, it's cloudy. There's a few patches of sunshine. Just keep going down this ridge and, you know, keep bouncing the sort of bits of lift coming off the sunny patches until you can get your wings over the ridge, which I just about did a bit further on. Mm -hmm. But it was a kind of, yeah, just have a bit of, uh, just step back. I think you said that, didn't you? Just, mm -hmm. just don't go into sort of panic mode. Just say, hang on. Mm -hmm. I, know, I, I know I've been in this situation before. I know I can deal with it. Just, just, you know, settle down yeah back yourself and don't back well don't back yourself into a uh, blind hole i did i did look around and think what would i do if this ridge doesn't work and there was a field i could just about get to and that sort of really took the stress out of the situation and then you can concentrate on getting yeah. yourself on the hill. kind of a, a bit of a once i wake up call but it was just you know you can get, yeah. get caught out and just be prepared for it i mean the, 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 it, it, it is a matter, a matter of giving yourself options. It, it, always having options. Once you start running out of options, um, you know, you, you, that's where it starts to get dangerous. And the other, you know, I mean, effectively what we're talking about, is don't worry about it. Um, what we're, we're talking about is, is, is giving yourself time to draw yourself back. I always sort of say to myself, fly to a safe place. <laughs> you know, I'm talking power here, but put yourself in a safe situation if you can, if you see my point. And if you're not in a safe situation, you know, being blunt, is you turn around and say, how can I minimize the damage? you know, being honest about it. Because, you know, I'm not, gliding is a risk sport. It's why a lot of us enjoy it because we are managing risk. You know, and risk is, uh, you know, the probability of, of something not going, you know, your actions resulting in, in some form of, uh, consequence that you don't wish and so it really is a matter of managing risk and that ultimately result re, re, ultimately comes back to yourself and managing yourself because that's the key to a, a successful pilot ultimately I, I think i've said enough on that i mean that's what i wanted to talk about today to finish because we've got the whole soaring season ahead and we want to bloody enjoy it. it. It's quite simple. And so, you know, that's about it. Any questions before I go on to a little video? Any questions at all? You got any points to raise about that, like Alistair? No, no, no. <laughs> okay, right. We'll just come to... We'll just come to this. Let's see. Oh. Yeah, oh, I didn't finish. Post-flight analysis, right? I always use post-flight analysis, right? Because what have I learned from that flight? And it depends upon your degree of level as to what you do. I always take recordings, tracings, all the rest of it and go through it and learn from that previous flight. I mean, you came away with lessons yesterday, no doubt, Stuart. Okay. Right, so this is what it's all about, all right? Now, this is John Williams. See, I, you know, John has stress levels down here, in my opinion. He's got a mind like, 
a steel vice. Now, where's the best lift? It's a wave bar, winds from right to left. Where's the best lift? Where? What, there? Or there? That, there. Okay, you're right. That's the best lift. Okay? So, the thing to look at, before we go into it, is that's the netto. And for people who don't know what a netto is, it tells you what the actual air mass is doing. Okay, so as you can see, he's flying along the wave bar and he's in four knots. There's his Sage variometer, right? And there is his airspeed. And down here is his altimeter. And he's at about four and a half thousand feet. And this is on a flight to Mullikintyre. And these videos are on the club computer. So we just put this up. Okay. Sorry. There we go. Oops. Damn. All right. Sorry. Let's just go through again. Hang on. Why is that not going? Damn. That's it. I'll do it on a computer. That's the easiest way. I haven't got the uh, vario a noise, so I find it I find it quite just irritating. So just to go through it, yeah, there he is, five knots there. Uh, speed about 110 knots. Oh, damn, have I stopped it? Oh, f <laughs> <laughs> I did, that was said quite, all right, sorry, let's start again. Oh, I do apologize, let's go right from the beginning. Oh, what a mess. Right, okay. All right, okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just stay there and talk through it. So there he is. He's doing about, what, uh, 110 knots there. Four knots, only climbing at two knots, and he's at 4,300 feet. See, the altitude that's being shown there is on uh, 1013. So it's 4,300 feet, speed going up to 110 knots. Now, what John does is he waits until he gets the strongest lift before he slows up. And he does a, he, he does a, a climb. So, yeah, there we go. Still four knots. We've got that little bit of cloud that we were looking at. And he's, he's shortly be coming up to it. And this is, this is if we look at the moving map, he's to the, there's uh, Glen Earn, sorry, Lock Earn. So he's he's sort of south of uh, Comrie there. So 115 knots. So here's the lift starting to go up now. So he's doing 115 knots and he's climbing, actually climbing at four knots. Ten knots. There we are, there's uh, Comrie just down there. Look at that, ten knots. That's wave flying for you. And John's starting to slow down a bit <laughs> to 90 knots. <laughs> Whoops, no, he's coming back. Now he's using it to climb away. 
And this is what you call energy management. <laughs> Okay, there you go. So that's what it's all about. This is what we've got to look forward to this summer. So, hmm? what day? Yeah. Well, we got we got four to six days to work on. Okay. Right. So there we go. Enjoy 2023. Oh right, I don't know. Yesterday. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Okay, right, that's it. All right, thank you.